Okay, folks, good morning, everybody. If we could start making our way toward a table. So grab your coffee and your donuts. And let us open with a prayer, then I'll tell you how we're going to proceed today. Lord God, Heavenly Father, as we continue to work our way through the latter portion of the church here and are reminded that we are in the end times, we thank you that because of the faith which you have worked in our heart, faith in Christ as our Savior, we have nothing to fear. But we do ask that you would use us, utilize us as individuals, as a church, as a church body, to reach out to those who do not yet know the joy of knowing Jesus as we do. And as we trace the Apostle Paul's journey of faith and see in his journey of faith the journey of others, perhaps ourselves, we ask that you would bless and direct our Bible study this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hopefully you've all picked up the, uh, the handout for today to the ends of the year, session one, uh, The Call of God. Actually, our session one was watching the entire movie last, last week. Um, this was produced by the people who, or by our, our church body and by the people who put together the video. So um, there may be more material here or less than we need. I think usually there's more, but we're going to try to, we're going to follow what we may be skipping around or giving some por portions of it short shrift in order to get through to some of the other more meaningful sessions. But I think it, it provides us with a good guideline. And it begins with relating to the world story. And this is just to get us to, uh, started before we watch a segment, a brief segment of the video. Everyone has a story. Usually the topic of their story is what they are most passionate about. It could be an event, an achievement, or the direction that life has taken. But things change. Life's journey often takes us in directions we may not have expected, especially if we are on the wrong path, a new story. Is it safe to say, well, I should ask you, if when you scripted the life, when you scripted the, the, uh, the story of your life as, say, a, a young person or maybe even in grade school or whenever you started thinking about that, is it safe to say that for most of us, life doesn't always follow the script? <laughs> yeah, I think it's probably safe to say, which, which means it is just all the more... Um, consoling to know that God is ultimately in control. I'm certain that the Apostle Paul's life did not follow the script which he had originally thought it might go. What is the world? Here's a, just a couple of questions. What's the world around us most passionate about? Discuss the topics and activities that most engage the hearts and conversations of the people in your community. Give that some thought, some follow-up questions. You can answer any of these. Um, what are the people around us, or what do most people commonly state as being goals in life? Uh, how does the world define success, et cetera, et cetera? Anybody, anybody have any thoughts on, on that? Sue? Personal prosperity. prosperity? Personal prosperity. OK, a goal in life is to be. Yeah. All right. Vani? Mm -hmm. Economics. I remember talking to a high schooler in my first congregation way back when, and I said, well, what do you want to do, do when you grow up or what do you know when you, what, in, your, in your career? He says, well, I'm going to be a millionaire. <laughs> so, well, there's a few steps in between there, you know. <laughs> well, I haven't really thought about that, but I, that's my goal. Mm -hmm. Well. And I think that probably is you know, many people's goal because they would define economic prosperity with, with success. Here's a question that I just jotted for myself. Do the people 
who you talk to or the people who you rub shoulders with um, or extended family are people in your estimation are people concerned about spiritual matters John for the John says for the most part no okay except when we touch our own people what have you found are people interested in spiritual matters is is there more of an openness to talk about spiritual matters or is it still one of these things one of the taboo subjects you don't talk about you know religion and politics in polite company mark mm -hmm. Most people are standoffish to talk about, unless, the, okay. If you approach them, they, they may be happy to converse, but they're not going to offer that. Anybody else have any thoughts? Yeah, Lois. I just heard something that interested me from a coworker who's in her 30s, and she said that she's interested in spiritual matters, but she's afraid to Okay, so Lois just said one of her coworkers who's maybe in her 30s said it was her opinion that the, young, the generation coming behind them or the younger generation, millennials or w whatever term that we would use or beyond that or um, Gen, Z. Gen Z, okay, seems to be more embracing spiritual matters than the generation before. Yeah, I don't have the statistics, but I don't have the statistics, but I think that um, one of the, the fastest growing groups, and maybe you've heard this, is the, the nuns, that the N-O-N-E, the nuns meaning that they're just really not interested in, in spiritual matters. They have really no affiliation. And again, you hear that a lot that, well, they may be, they may be spiritual, but what does that mean? Spiritual does not necessarily mean Christian. Yes? Because of where I live, I have a contact with a lot of older people. Yes. And I find the Catholics are very willing to protect their faith, but nobody else is. Okay, where uh, Sally just said where she lives, she has found that she is in contact with a lot of uh, elderly citizens, older people. And, and that the Roman Catholic population is, is willing to talk about their, their faith. Okay, John? I usually find that people have problems that have tried several, several secular solutions are kind of open to speaking. Okay, people who have uh, problems who have tried several secular courses may, and it almost kind of gets to be as a last resort, well, you know, we'll try you know, we'll try religion. All right. Um, next it says, read Acts 16, 1 through 10. If you have a Bible, um, if you have a Bible, please turn to Acts 16, 1 through 10. If you don't, just listen. And then after that, we are going to watch to the ends of the earth. But Acts 16 is going to take us into the setting for our study. If you just want to follow, around, follow along, he came to Derby and then to Lystra, he is Paul, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was a Jewess and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The brothers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. Now remember, Paul is on his second journey. He's already gone through this general area once before, so he's strengthening those mission congregations that he had started. Paul and his companions traveled through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, 
having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we, and if it's a we session, that means Luke is involved, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Macedonia, of course, and we mentioned this last time, Macedonia would be, would be modern-day Greece. Well, in fact, there still is a Macedonia, but it would be modern-day modern day Greece. The point is that Paul now, with this Macedonian call, is moving the gospel into Europe. Now it says, watch to the ends of the earth, a short segment, segment one, and as you watch this, you can think about these questions, express what most stood out for you about this part of Paul's life, and what questions does it raise, and then we'll pick up on that. So I'm going to hit the lights here. We're going to watch just this first section, the call to God, the call of God. And if this doesn't work, there are several people here who... All right, there, there we go. Yeah, yeah, so there we go. Yeah, I think we got a good volume. Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now, get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen of me and what I will show you. I will rescue you from your own people and from the nations. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. For I am commanding that you bring salvation to the ends of the earth. That's as far as we're going to go, just that brief introduction, because today we're going to be talking about Paul's personal journey. And that sets the backdrop for that. Anything stand out for you in this first section? Any questions about this first section? Yes, Steve. I believe that is correct. Yeah, I believe that the, the, the point is being made that Paul at one time was a persecutor 
which he never, which he never forgot. Any other questions or, uh, regarding the video itself? And that's going to come up. So, um, learning from Paul's story. Paul's call to faith, letter A, an unexpected conversion. Acts 16 brings us right into the middle of Paul's journey. He risked even his own life to tell people about Jesus. It was what he was passionate about, but that wasn't always the case. In fact, it was exactly the opposite. And number one says, read Paul's story when he was known as Saul. Write down the points that stand out most for you. Then be ready to retell Paul's story in your own words. Well, um, what I would like to do, it would be worthwhile working through this section. Follow along. I'm going to read this section. If you have a Bible, follow along. And then if you can, just jot down the first thing that comes to your mind, a comment or a thought from each one of these little bookmarks. Acts 6, 8 through 15. So that's where we're... That's where we're going to start, Acts chapter 6. Again, just listen and then jot down. We're, we're, we're following Paul's, Paul's journey. Acts chapter 6, verse 8. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia. These men began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against his wisdom or the spirit by whom he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, we have heard Stephen speak words of blasphemy against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council. They produced false witnesses who testified, This fellow never stops speaking against this holy place and against the law, for we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Let's move on to Acts chapter 7, next verse. Then the high priest asked him, are these charges true? And what follows is, um, if you haven't read through Acts chapter 7 and Stephen's defense, it's really worthwhile doing as far as the way in which he gives a condensed history of the Old Testament. But we move to verse 51. So Stephen is defending the faith, talking about why he is doing what he is doing. Verse 51, and this is how, uh, this is how he ends up his, his sermon, if you will. You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you are just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your fathers did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was put into effect through angels but have not obeyed it. When they heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold the sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. And Paul was there giving approval to his death. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. So that's actually the next two sections there. Those, and the last section we're going to take a look at, Acts chapter 9. 
Meanwhile, in Acts chapter in Acts chapter uh, um, eight, we have some events, and then toward the end of Acts chapter eight is the story of Philip and the Ethiopian, and then chapter nine. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if any, any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. All right, those are the six the, uh, the scripture sections. Anybody have any comments or any anybody jot anything down for Acts six eight through fifteen? A thought, John. A parallel to Jesus when he was in front of the high priest. Okay then. Yep, Mark. Okay, so all you talking about? Yeah, okay. How about the next, next section? Acts 7, 1, 51 to 60. That talks about Stephen and Saul was there. So the, it, it, the point is it's pretty clear Paul was opposed to the Christian faith, adamantly opposed. Acts 8, verse 1 through 4, anything there? Terry? Okay. How violently the world and Satan hates the church, and it's still going on. How violently the world and Satan hates the church, and it's still it's still going on. Yeah, this was not this, this was not the well. Okay, that may be true for you. It's not true for me. You know, et cetera, et cetera. This was a violent reaction against the Christian faith. And, and we got to, I'm sure we, we know this, but if you were a Christian, you were getting it from both ends. You were getting it from all the, the, the non-Christians, the Jews, the Gentiles who just thought you were nuts. And then um, you got it from the Jewish believers who thought that you were um, an aberration of them, that you were a spinoff, uh, but you were not, this whole talk about Jesus as being the Messiah they didn't have any time for that at all, and so they were persecuting you. So Christians were getting shot at from all, you know, all directions, and I think that you know indicates certainly. Did you? Yes, John. Paul was a Pharisee's Pharisee. He was strong in his belief. He felt he was doing the world a good turn by eliminating Christians. These need these people need to be get rid of. You know they need to be gotten rid of. They're a, they're a, a scourge. And then anybody else? The last one, Acts nine, is his own, his conversion. Paul will talk about his. This is there's three times in the book of Acts where Paul recounts his uh, his conversion. This is the actual one, and then and later on. He'll be talking to other people, and he'll he'll explain how he became a Christian, and talk about his conversion. Mary, mm -hmm. I'll um, preface it well. The first three years, who knows a true believer even unto death. Saul was I went to Certainly, Jesus, but yeah. It shows the love of God as, I mean, it's converted. Right? right. And that's going to come up, you know, as Mary just said, Jesus could have wiped Saul out, but 
Rather, he converted him, he turned him, and he who was once, and Paul will say this, you know, once a persecutor of Christianity, you know, became its biggest proponent. Turn the page, please. Saul, otherwise known as Paul, once thought his life was so much better than others, more dedicated, more upright, more righteous. He was a fiery defender of the purity of his religion. It led him to become an extremist, a terrorist to the Christians. Saul thought he was doing God's will, and he didn't, and he didn't realize that he was actually working against God, persecuting Jesus because he persecuted Jesus' people. But God has a way of intervening even in the most unlikely lives and changed them around to accomplish his purpose. Number two says, look over Paul's comments in 1 Corinthians 5, 15, 9 to 10, and 1 Timothy 1, 13 to 16, point out how getting to know Jesus changed his mindset. And then think about this, how it changed his view of himself, of God, and of others. And what we've got here uh, underneath are those passages. So you don't need to look them up in the Bible. But since they're all printed out, so we've all got them, let's read them together. The first one from 1 Corinthians 15, 9 through 10. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am and his grace to me was not without effect. And Paul is the apostle of grace. He understood grace. He was the recipient of grace. Next passage, a little bit longer, but here again, Paul is now talking about this change in his life. Let's read that together. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now, if Paul was going to write a hymn, what might he entitle it? Chief of sinners, though I be, Jesus shed his blood for me. So Paul, Paul is not, uh, never, as we read him, especially in his latter years, and he looks, he never forgot what he was. Um, but whenever he did that, he always used it as a backdrop, as a springboard to talk about God's grace. But here's the point. Let's go back to that question. Point out how getting to know Jesus changed his mindset, his view of himself, of God, and of others. And let's try to do it this way. Let's do a before and after picture of Paul before the road to Damascus, or with the road to Damascus being the, the central point in his life. Before the road to Damascus, how did Paul feel about, what was his view of himself, of God, and of others? Himself first. Before the road to Damascus, what did Paul think about himself? Greg. Well, I would guess he thought he was a, he was a big shot. He was a leader. He was just, you know, a guy who was a big change. Yeah. I'm a big shot. I'm a leader. John, it said, I'm a Pharisee of Pharisees. He had a very high opinion of himself. And if you read in Philippians, um, you know, he'll, that's where he goes in talking about how you know, if anybody wants to get to heaven by being good, you know, I'm not trying to, he said, I'm not trying to brag, but, you know, I was this and this and this and this, you know. And, uh, and then he goes on to say in Philippians, but all this I count as rubbish and so forth. So before the road to Damascus, Paul thought very, very highly of himself. He was on a track where he believed he could perform his way into heaven, and thank you very much, I really expect to get there. God should be tickled pink to have a guy like me on his side. 
That's, that was Paul before the road to Damascus. After the road to Damascus, it is what? John. On this side, it's all performance-based salvation. And on this side, it's all grace. This is, I'm a big shot. I expect to get to heaven because God should be pleased with the life I live. And this one is chief of sinners, though I be. Jesus shed his blood for me. All right. Night and day. Let's go to the same thing, the split image. How about God? His view of, his view of God before and after the road to Damascus. And this is instructive, I think, because we know people, we may know people like this, or people are, are still struggling with these things. Okay, before and after the road to Damascus, his view of God. What's it like before? Jackie? Before he saw God's judgment over the Bible, and that's just, you know, he would be a time right there. Before he saw God as being the divine taskmaster in the sky, judgmental, I've got to appease him by my performance, I've got to make him love me, like me, and that's why I do the things I do. Okay, so a God who he was scared of and he had to appease. After? Sally? Great love. Great love, a heavenly father who had shown his love for him in sending Jesus so that he could be sure he was going to heaven. Night and day. Humility, we're going to talk about that and what that means. And so his view of God, God is no longer this angry, task, judgmental taskmaster in the sky who has to be placated and appeased by the way in which I live my life. And if I screw up, you know, he might zap me with a lightning bolt and therefore I'm going to be, you know, cross my T's and dot my I's to a loving Heavenly Father. The, you know, the, who, who takes in the prodigal son who returns, who understands his grace. How about other people? Before and after. Before the road to Damascus, after the road to Damascus. How did he view other people? And this is going to come up in his writings too. Before he thought he was better, he thought he was superior, Look down his nose at other people. After, he writes it in Romans. He he was the worst of all yeah, well, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That I'm part of this vast, unwashed group that I looked down my nose and looked down my nose at, you know, before. So he's got this these night and day, Terry, then John, yeah. All right, before the profundity of this statement. No, I mean, I mean, before he felt the nuance that all people should be like him, in other words, perform their way, good people, etc. I mean, he felt that was the way to salvation. And after, as a sinner who understood grace, he felt people should be like him. That's what you're saying, correct? Yeah. He had a, it was... It was such a swing that it could only be of God. He would not come to these conclusions on his own. All right, moving on. Um, other things. I know there are some. Uh, I know there are some J.S. Bach fans in this room. Um, J.S. Bach signed all of his works. What did he say? What, 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 were his, what were the initials after all of J.S. Bach's works? Three initials, and it wasn't J.S.B. <laughs> S.D.G. What does that mean? S.D.G. Sola Deo Gloria to God alone the glory. And so when you see S.D.G., you know, at the end of things, that means to God alone the glory. 
he recognized that everything he did, you know, his gifts and his, his immense gifts as a musician was uh, a gift of God to the glory of God. And that's how Paul viewed his life after the road to Damascus. Everything is to the glory of God. Um, go down to this next, let, just before letter B. Paul was living proof that God's grace and power are beyond measure. God changed Paul's pride into humility. No matter how far people have fallen or been deceived, no one is beyond rescue. And God not only rescues us from something, but also to something to fulfill his purposes and plans. The word humility came up with Paul. How would you describe Christian humility? If you had to give a de definition, how would you define Christian humility? Bonnie. Putting others before you. Putting others before you. Okay. Others? Others? Sally? Understanding that even as a Christian, that doesn't make you any better than anybody else. Understanding as a Christian, we're understanding our position that we're sinners. Okay. Sue? Sue? Okay. All right. And John. And we're hundred percent dependent on God, dependent on God's choosing. And when we understand, we look at our life from that perspective that God shows us it. We're no, we're no longer full of ourself. We're full of what God has done for us. We're grateful for what God has done for us. Somebody put it this way. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but is thinking of yourself less. Right? Because you are, you're moving away from it being all about me to being all about others, all about the God who has brought me to this point in my life. Paul's call to mission, a new focus for life. And again, I'm just going to run through this. When Saul became a Christian, his name became Paul. Anybody know why? Why, why, did, why, did, why did Saul become Paul? Why did Saul become Paul? I got, my oldest brother has been doing Hispanic mission work all his life. He was born Carl. But... Early on, he changed his name, or he's referred to as Carlos. And why would that be? Because that's the that's 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 the that's the um, people he was identifying with. Paul would be the Greek version of Saul. Saul would be the Hebrew version. Paul would be the Greek version. So he takes on he takes on a Greek rendering of his name because that's what God had called him to do. He was going to be working with this Gentile, non-Jewish population. At first, the Christians weren't sure if he was just trying to infiltrate them to turn them in. When Paul first converted, he had a reputation. And people heard, people heard, hey, Paul's one of us now. He's a Christian. And they're, uh, I'm just... Oh, okay, all right, you know, I'm still going to, yeah, all right. Um, you can hang out with them, and I'm not going to hang out with them. You know? I mean, that's what, you know, that's, that was, and that's why if we're, you know, there, there was a long period of education. You know, Paul, remember on the video, it says, so many years later, yeah, I think it was like, what, is it 13 or 16 or whatever, but um, there was a long time of, of, you know, of preparation. So Paul did not, have immediate uh, uh, reception from the Christian community because they knew they knew who he was and what he had been, and they weren't quite so sure. At first, the Christians weren't sure if he was just trying to infiltrate them to turn them in. And this is just kind of a sidelight, but you know this is kind of interesting because that was a you know that was a tactic. Do you remember um, my pinging here? Or? Do you um, do you know the do you know the 
do you know the uh, the, the story when when our baby when babies are baptized uh, oftentimes well most times we have people standing up along with them at their baptism and the, we call them their sponsors you know where that whole practice originally came from it came from the early church at a time when people were trying to ferret out where the Christians were and so there are people who would there are there were um, antagonists of Christians who would pretend to be interested in Christianity so they could find out who these people were and where they were hanging out and where they were studying and so forth so that they could then persecute them and it got to be this happened enough to where in the Christian community if someone said they were interested in learning more about the Christian faith they didn't take it just at face value anymore what they said is uh, what the, the understanding was you have to have a sponsor someone who can vouch for you that you are this is genuine and authentic that you want to really learn about the Christian faith that's where the whole sponsor thing came so someone who would could vouch for your the veracity of your willing your desire to learn about the Christian faith in time it was transferred over to the baptismal uh, font and so forth down to this very day but the idea that the idea of of people pretending to be Christians so they could infiltrate the community and then persecute them um, that that was happening already in the you know in the early church all right we go on uh, but God said, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. Paul calls himself an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Let's just define a term. What's an apostle? What is an apostle? An apostle comes from a Greek word, which means one who is sent out. And in its broadest, in its narrowest sense, an apostle was... Uh, one of the disciples or someone who knew Jesus face to face personally and could be a witness to his resurrection and so we sometimes call the 12 disciples also the 12 or actually 11 disciples the the 11 apostles we talk about the Apostle John you know the Apostle Peter they were they were sent out they, besides disciples they were also apostles in a little broader sense an apostle was anyone who was sent out by the church. Um, and in the book of Acts, for example, Barnabas is referred to as an apostle. And in a sense, we could talk our, our missionaries are apostles in that way, in a, in a broader sense. Was Paul an apostle in the broad sense or the narrow sense? Was Paul an apostle in the broad sense or the narrow sense? Both. He was certainly an apostle in the narrow sense because Jesus Christ appeared to him. He had that interaction on the road to Damascus. He had this interface with Jesus. And the church sent him out as well. So, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, sent not from men or by men, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father. This was not just a call to faith, but a redefining of his life number one next page page three describe Paul's mission as defined by God in Acts 13 47 and 26 18 through 16 through 18 again these are printed out let's read these together the first passage I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth now the next one from 20, Acts 26. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So Paul's mission field, as defined by God, was to reach out to those who had not grown up in the Jewish faith, to the non-Jews, but we're going to see 
people who had a spiritual base, but based on a natural knowledge of God and Paul's, Paul's role was to turn them to the truth, to move them from a natural knowledge of God, because we're going to see these people, no one is going to say, when you look at Paul's epistle, or Paul's, Paul's in the book of Acts, no one's going to say, I don't believe in God. They just had all kinds of wrong ideas about God. And that's what God said, I'm going to, we're going to turn them from, from their wrong ideas, from darkness, darkness to light. Do you remember Paul's interaction with the people? This is not in Philippi now. This is now in Athens on, on the Areopagus Mars Hill. He says, he, he, um, and if, if, if you've ever been to Athens, there is, there's, this, there's this outcropping of rock, it's kind of like a kind of, of a, a ledge area, and if you look above there, there's the Parthenon, and if you look below, you're going to see the remnants of of uh, temples made to the various gods and goddesses. And do you remember Paul's interaction with the Athenians, all the you know the deep, the deep thinkers, and he says to them, he says to them, you know, he he, he said, I've been walking around your city. And I, if you can almost picture this, you can see him on this outcropping. And he can, you can see him waving his hand and say, Men of Athens, I can see you're a very religious people. He saw a temple above him. He saw temples below him. He said, as I was walking around, I even saw a temple dedicated to who? The unknown God, which means instinctively they knew, I think we're missing somebody. We don't know who it is. There's something more. And he says, what you don't know, I want to tell you about. So he appealed to the fact that they had spirituality, but they didn't know the truth. And that's what God had called him to do. To move them from this spiritual base, based on a natural knowledge of God, to the truth of the gospel. All right, I want to skip down um, to the next big paragraph where it says many times. Many times we may wish God would talk to us directly to tell us our next steps or the right decisions. Uh, don't expect that our journey in life will be neatly spelled out for us, but being a witness of Jesus and a light to the world is not just a task, it is our identity. So being a Christian is not what we do, it's what we are. Our call to action doesn't usually come as dramatic as it came to Paul, but may become obvious if we look at the people around us. The work may not be as high profile as Paul's, but God involves us in very important roles. Each role is important. Don't overlook your home, your friends, your community. This is talking about how God redirected Paul's life and what this point is making is that um, changed his identity and he has some specific work to do but the point is we've all got work to do. John. Oh no. Correct. The opportunities may be not of your own choosing, but God put you there. For such a time as this, remember the whole thing with Esther, that, that Old Testament? Yeah, I couldn't, you know, because uh, Uncle Mordecai says that, you know, I know you wouldn't have chosen this, but for such a time as this, God put you in this place in this time. I think we can say that all the time. So, and that's, that's the point. And do not underestimate the importance of our role wherever God has us because we can have an impact for the gospel. I can have an impact on you by teaching this class. You have an impact on the people you rub shoulders with for the gospel, even without saying a word, just by the way in which you conduct your life.
Sue? Mm -hmm. But it wasn't what they expected. Yeah, yeah. They were saying, you know, squash Paul. Destroy Paul. He's an enemy of the gospel. Smite him. And, uh, and, and God said, I'm going to do better than that. I'm going to convert him. And then he became the, you know, he became the greatest Christian missionary the world, has, the world has ever seen. I think the point is here, you know, one of the great Lutheran teachings or that was uncovered during the Reformation is, and we've talked about this, is the teaching, the doctrine of vocation, which means God's got us where he wants us. And wherever we are, we can have an impact for him and for the gospel. And let's not... Let's not spend much let's let's not spend time wishing we were somewhere else or whatever, but recognizing God's got us at this place and at this time for his for his purposes. You know, sometimes people will uh, sometimes people uh, you know uh, um, will come and say, "I really want to serve God. I want to be a pastor or a teacher." Is that the only way you can serve God? Obviously not. Here again. We serve God by carrying out our work in a way which glorifies him and which represents Jesus Christ well, wherever we're at. And then we're doing, that's our mission field. All right. Um, I want to go to the back story, to the back page. Yes. Mm -hmm. When he attacked the church in Jerusalem, they go all over, and what was the key phrase they said afterwards? And those who went out spread the gospel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Satan, um, <clears throat> Satan can't win. The gates of hell will not prevail against you know against the the church of God. Yes, Sue. Oh yeah, yeah. It's probably yeah. It, I don't think um, we think, and maybe rightly so. And uh, not making any political or editorial comment, that we're moving into a time where Christianity is having less and less of an impact on the world in which we live. You think that's a fair statement? Yeah. All right. And I mean, just just if if the gauge is what the uh, you know the norms of society, how they're changing. At one time, at one time, they were based whether they knew it or not. They were based on Christian principles. Those times, that that seems to be that seems to be gone. All right. And yet, this is the time God's got us living. And I don't know. It's you know. It, it's it's not all that helpful to think about how this this is terrible. What's going on? It may be, but this is where God's got us. And therefore, our role is to do what we can to, be, to have an impact for the gospel in whatever way we can. I think, and I've said this before, um, Christianity and the values of the Christian faith are no longer the big landmass upon which our country was built and for Christian principles. I think that the Christian faith is now becoming not the landmass, but a good sized island. But when people, but it's an island which, when people understand that they're they're flailing, they're going to be swimming toward, and we got to be ready to we got to be ready to, uh, you know, to to help them up. I think that's I think that's that's the way that's the way it is, and I, so it shouldn't surprise us. It shouldn't surprise us because Jesus tells tells us it's going to be this way. That that the world is drifting away from, you know, drifting away from him, but we got to be ready when people come to an understanding of the bankruptcy of trying to live a life without 
Christ at the core and God as the foundation. John. The gospel is making big inroads in other places of the world. That is true. You know, that's, a, well, that's one of the big Luther quotes. The gospel is like a passing shower. You know, it, 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 a, a passing shower in that it takes, it, 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 uh, it rains on and it, it fertilizes, you know, a certain area, but it passes. And it was, look at, people will say, look at Europe now, which is not strongly Christian. And it kind of passed to another place. Where is the gospel bearing the most fruit now? Africa is a strong Christian is a strong Christian nation. I think that it, it's making inroads certainly in Asia, and so forth. The house churches and so, um, the gospel is always going to be with us, and it's always going to do its its work. We're just living in a time where it does not have the influence that it once did in our world and our and in our society. Um, we're out of time. It's uh, thoughts, general thoughts or comments on anything that we've been talking about here. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think I, I wish I could encapsulate what you just said, but just the, the, the idea that persecution continues, not just in other countries, but even in our country. You know, I heard a very, this is the last thing, and this is kind of, um, but it, it tying this into, you know, when is the, when are the mass murders and shooting, when is that going to stop? Yeah. And, but again, just talking about the impact which all of this is having in our society, I heard this, and maybe you heard the same thing. It was interesting that when the guy went on his rampage in California at that country western bar, in times before, people would go, they, they would be screaming and all helter-skelter. But what, what, what did you hear about this? When the shooting started, everybody became silent, and they hit the ground, and they waited for they waited for an opportunity to to escape. We have become so used to this in our society. I just think that's a very telling, you know, it's a very it's a very telling thing. And here again, if there's nothing else for and for for the for the non-believer or the non-Christian, um, as tragic as these events are, what they can tell people is or remind us all, but especially others, of the brevity of life. And that it's, it's, important, it's important to know who we are and where we're going and so forth. Because in our day and age, we just never know. And on that not so cheery note, but, but on, <laughs> on a, it's, it's a not so cheery note, but it's an important, it's an important note. So let's, we'll close with the, with the blessing here. Lord, bless us and keep us. Lord, make your face shine upon us and be gracious to us. Lord, look with favor upon us and give us peace. Amen. All right, next week we're going to watch Paul move into Philippi and all the different cultures and different kinds of people he meets. Mm -hmm.